I bring to you an epistle reading from Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. If you'd like to read along, you'll find it on page 953 of your Pew Bibles. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. Well, our second reading today is from the book of Ruth, this uh, powerful Hebrew parable, as the Israelites called it, uh, Mashal, this powerful story filled with truths that we have preserved in our Old Testament uh, today. And uh, we begin reading in Ruth chapter 1, verse 22. So Naomi returned together with Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who came back with her from the country of Moab. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now Naomi had a kinsman on her husband's side, a prominent rich man of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain, behind someone in whose sight I may find favor. She said to her, Go, my daughter. So she went. She came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. As it happened, she came to to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz came from Bethlehem. He said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, To whom does this young woman belong? The servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. So she came and she has been on her feet from early morning until now, without resting even for a moment. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman Boaz, with whose, whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. But don't make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. And he will tell you what to do. She said to her, all that you tell me I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had instructed her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and he was in a contented mood, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came stealthily and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight the man was startled and turned over and there lying at his feet was a woman. He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your cloak over your servant for you are next of kin. He said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. This last instance of your loyalty is better than the first. You have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. For all the assembly of my people know that you are a worthy woman. 
So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without next of kin. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pause for a moment before we talk about this exciting story. Oh, gracious and loving God, we thank you today for your presence here with us. God, we come before you today carrying all of the concerns, the anxieties of this past week. Today we lay them at your feet and ask you to fill us with your grace that is sufficient enough to give us the strength to overcome whatever challenges this life places in our paths. We thank you for this chance to meditate upon your inspired word that fills us with hope, that fills us with peace, and teaches us about you. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it was the end of the school year, and a father asked his son if he could see his report card. I'm sorry, Dad, his son replied, but I don't have it. Well, Dad was concerned, and he said, Why don't you have it? His son responded, Well, I gave it to my friend. He wanted to scare his parents. <laughs> Bad grades on the report card. Change of any kind is disruptive, including the sudden change of a child's grades. And as that story also illustrates, change isn't all necessarily good. Sometimes change doesn't make things better. Yet as we discussed last week, we live in a society that for better and worse, it's changing rapidly. And it's driven in large part by technological innovations that are fundamentally changing the ways people communicate with and relate to each other. It's changing human society itself in profound ways. So how can we ensure that we embrace all this change in ways that, that build God's kingdom rather than tearing it down? How can we participate in change in ways that, that nourish uh, and, and nurture people's lives and faith rather than working against people's well-being? These are big questions, huge questions, and important. But thankfully, the Old Testament book of Ruth speaks to this. You know, this wonderful ancient story, it is a treasure for us today. Because it illustrates how to affect genuine, lasting, positive change. This sermon, it's the second in a series entitled A New Reality, which is exploring this book. And in our study of chapter 1 last week, I'll give you a little recap, we learned that Ruth, the young heroine in the story, she demonstrates the importance at times of breaking barriers, of breaking existing unhelpful rules and structures and customs to affect needed change. Remember, Ruth does this herself by making great personal sacrifices to care for her mother-in-law, Naomi, after the death of both Ruth and Naomi's husbands. 
Now, Ruth, remember, she is a Moabite, a citizen of the kingdom of Moab. Yet she agrees to follow Naomi back to Naomi's former hometown of Bethlehem in Israel. What's the big deal about this? Well, she's putting herself at great risk for doing it. Because the kingdoms of Israel and Moab historically didn't get along well with each other at all. I included actually a map today in your bulletins on page 6 that uh, gives you, uh, helps you visualize where Bethlehem was, Naomi's home, and where Moab was, where Ruth lived. Uh, that's where those places were located in the days when this story, uh, its setting is, is depicted. Uh, but not only does this courageous young woman travel with Naomi, into what to her is a hostile foreign land of Israel, but she also agrees to adopt Israelite culture and faith. So Ruth essentially crashes through all these customs, these rules and structures that are barriers to her conviction to create a new and better reality with somebody that she loves. She places compassion and care for her mother-in-law above all these other things that were getting in the way of that. But as her story continues, Ruth shows us that more is needed to create a, a new reality, a new kingdom, if you will, than just breaking down the old. The story illustrates the importance of also putting in the time, energy, and focus, and passion required to work with others, to cooperate with others, to collaborate with others, to build something up in its place. And this morning we read excerpts from her story uh, that show us how she does this. I encourage you to read the uh, entire story on your own, uh, some other time, of course, not during the sermon, <laughs> but, uh, you know, some other time. But in our first section today, you know, Ruth and Naomi, they arrive in Bethlehem from Moab, and they immediately get to work rebuilding their lives, which for Ruth includes looking for a husband. Remember, Ruth had been married, and her beloved husband passed away. So she seeks to remarry and to start a family with somebody else. And while she's out in the fields working one day, she catches the eye of a guy named Boaz. Now, uh, the name Boaz is derived from two Hebrew words that together essentially mean he is strength. And uh, the Hebrew word used to describe him uh, in chapter 2, describe his character, is the word kayil, which describes someone who was respected and honorable. So he's, you know, strong and he's respected and he's honorable. Further, verse 1 also tells us that Boaz is related to Naomi on her late husband's side, and it calls him a goel which was quite a compliment. It was a word used to describe someone absolutely committed to protecting their loved ones. It's like that parent, you know, who if somebody threatens their child, they, you know, very, you know, uh, they, you know intensely uh, work to protect their child. The Goel was, was someone who cared deeply for other people. So, all of this about Boaz essentially tells us that he's, you know, what we call today, he's a really good guy. You know, he's a great catch. He's, he's a one groovy dude, you know. He's a, a stud muffin, you know, is what we used to call, but whatever, when I was younger. But, uh, you know, and he being related to Naomi, if he and Ruth were to marry, Ruth would rebuild not only her family, but she would also ensure Naomi's well-being because Boaz was the kind of guy who would make sure of that. 
And this is really important from a practical standpoint. Because remember, we've discussed before, in the ancient world, there wasn't much of a social safety net. Your family was your safety net. If you were without close familial connections and you experienced health or financial problems, well, then you were pretty much out of luck. You know, you you didn't have uh, a whole lot of hope. So marrying Boaz was another great way, in addition to building Ruth's family, it was a great way for Ruth to care for her mother-in-law, Naomi. And knowing that Boaz has taken an interest in Ruth, in our second section today, this is where Naomi The mother-in-law steps in. She encourages Ruth to reach out to Boaz romantically. She gets right to the point, Naomi does. And and she does this by saying to Ruth in chapter one verse, I mean chapter three, verse three, she says, Now wash and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. When he, Boaz, lies down, then go and uncover his feet and lie down. Now, I know to us today, this seems like an odd way to make a uh, you know, romantic overture. Maybe even a little creepy, I would go so far as to say. You know, going up to somebody you don't know while they're asleep, uncovering their feet and laying down next to them. See, today, most of us, if we were Boaz, we'd probably call the cops if somebody we didn't know did that to us. I mean, could you imagine being asleep and somebody starts messing with your feet that you don't know. But in the ancient world, strangely enough, this was one of the ways, the recognized ways, that a woman, essentially what we'd call today, asked a guy out. Um, So Naomi here is basically telling Ruth... You go, girl. You know, she's saying, don't wait for that guy to get around to making the first move. He's fiddling around. Make the first move yourself. Girl power. See, that's what Naomi's telling her. And so Ruth, she says, okay. And and she does this. And when Boaz wakes up, uh, she says in verse 9, Ruth says, spread your cloak over your servant. Now, that wasn't because Ruth was cold, see. That was actually a marriage proposal. That was one of the ways that women asked men to marry them, to have, you know, place their, their cloak over them. I know, I know, it also seems weird, but, you know, ancient people would probably think a lot of the things we do are pretty weird also. So, uh, Ruth here, she is taking the bull by the horn. She's laying everything on the line. She's putting herself out there. She's going out on a limb, completely opening herself up to rejection. She doesn't know this guy personally. She's, you know, uh, she, but yet here she goes. She's not only asking him out, but she's asking him to marry her right away, just after the guy wakes up from sleeping. Um, so, you know, she's she's really, you know, it must have been a nerve-wracking moment for Ruth. I, I would have been a basket case if I were her, but her willingness to do this, you see, it demonstrates Ruth's commitment, not only to to break apart cultural barriers by entering this foreign land with Naomi, but to also get to work while she's there to rebuild a new life for her and Naomi. She's not messing around. She's courageous. She's getting right down to what needs to be done. And the result... Well, Boaz replies in verse 10, he says, May you be blessed by the Lord. 
which is a good start. It's better than, you know, uh, get out of here and leave me alone. He says, may you be blessed by the Lord. And then he continues, this last instance of your loyalty is better than the first. You have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich, and now do not be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. For all the assembly of my people know that you are a worthy woman. And then yada, 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 he goes on and on. But Boaz, basically, he's saying here, you know, Ruth, yes. Yes, I'll marry you. I accept your proposal. You could have had any guy you wanted. I know, I know Justin Bieber, but you chose me. But you won't be disappointed. I'm going to be the best husband you could ever have had. In fact, the Hebrew word Boaz uses in verse 11 to describe Ruth, it's translated as worthy, but it actually was an allusion to the worthy woman described in Proverbs 31, which was essentially the best compliment a man could give a woman in that culture. You know, so this basically turns out to be a really mushy love scene here. You know, Ruth is, is proposing to Boaz, you know, she's uncovering his feet and, you know, put the, put the blanket over me and Boaz is, is honoring her as, a, as an amazing, worthy woman. I mean, you can, you can almost hear, you know, a 1980s love song, you know, playing in the background of this scene as, as you know, these, these two are, you know, uh, you know becoming one and, and you know, uh, but it even gets even better better as the story continues we we learn in our our third section that after Ruth and Boaz are married they give birth to a direct ancestor of the great King David the Israelite king about whom God says elsewhere I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever so Ruth's commitment to rebuild a new life, to do what's right, to place compassion for her mother-in-law above, you know, all these rules and regulations and all this stuff, uh, in addition to just breaking down barriers to it, her, her, her condition, her commitment to rebuild a new life ended up not only creating this new reality for her and Naomi, but it also laid the foundation in the story for the new Israelite kingdom that would flourish in the future under the leadership of King David. And it's also a pretty radical statement about uh, King David's ancestry that, uh, you know, one of his great-grandparents was a Moabite. This is a radical story, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's very applicable to us today because there's a lot of talk in our society today about disruptive change, right? I mean, we, we hear about it, uh, we read about it, uh, you know, breaking apart existing structures, you know, things being shaken up everywhere. But unless we like Ruth, unless we, regardless of our viewpoint, are willing to put in the time and the energy and the focus and the sacrifice and the passion and the willingness to collaborate and work with others to build a new reality, the new reality that comes next, all we'll really be doing is making a mess. See, Ruth teaches us here that building God's kingdom requires the courage not only to break barriers that are there, but also the courage to love others, to listen to them, to learn from them, and to work together collaboratively with them to affect genuine, lasting, positive change together. That is when God's Spirit will honor what we've done 
by working through us to transform everything for the better for generations to come is what the message of Ruth tells us as, as her work in her day and age laid the foundation for the great kingdom of Israel. So, you know, this ancient story challenges us to ask ourselves, is there something I know of right now that I feel needs to change in my life, in my community, you know, in the world? And, and if so, am I willing to follow Ruth's courageous example, not only in breaking barriers, but in working with others to build up that new reality. Am I willing to follow her example? May God bless us as we answer that question for ourselves. Amen.